this count as a pilot test? It's pilot testing my patience, Gus. <laughs> oh. Uh, eee, whoo, jeez. I'm Gus. Welcome to the Dire Gentleman channel. And I'm Henry. Oh, man. We watched the horrible NFT cartoon, uh, The Red Ape Family, which, thankfully, for people who just enjoy, you know, quality and happiness, only has one episode currently. Buddy, I, I, all I can say is capitalism breeds innovation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the ultimate response to that talking point. Like, capitalism breeds innovation. Oh, yeah? Explain the red ape family and why it sucks so hard. So, so here's the thing. This is a uh, cartoon made um, to promote... NFTs, these non-fungible tokens that are like the next evolution of cryptocurrency, I don't know what they are, and this show didn't explain it very well either. But, but Gus, they find the most valuable um, NFT in it, the most valuable non-fuckable token, and uh, it's more valuable than the city of Paris. Yeah, all I need to know, it's more valuable than the city of Paris in the awful tower. Oh, it's, this is the caliber of humor in this thing. All right, so to give both the audience and Gus a little bit more background info, um, NFTs, which, by the way, are a terrible idea that are bad for all of us and you shouldn't support, and we definitely don't support. But what are they? It, an NFT is basically uh, a link which is made by the blockchain, the blockchain being uh, the same process through which uh, crypto currency is made which is through like huge piles of like gas guzzling server banks which are atrocious for the environment and essentially you don't own the image itself you own a unique link to the image or video or whatever the nft isn't the object itself it's you buying a unique link to it uh yeah okay so it's worthless it's 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 basically it, its primary usage is uh pump and dump schemes which are a thing primarily in crypto where people will artificially elevate the value of something by say uh getting a celebrity to endorse it uh or making a horrendous cartoon and then once it reaches a certain level of value they uh, sell all of their crypto and jump ship with the uh, the price plummeting, usually straight afterwards, which we saw recently with the very ironically named Squid Game Crypto, and also the, uh, more appropriately for this video, named Monkey Jizz Crypto. Both of those are real. Not making that up. Crypto is a fucking farce. Listen, I am not a person who is completely uncritical of capitalism. In fact, I'm very vocally critical of a lot of its problems, but one thing you can do to convince me that there's some merit to this economic system, I don't know, keep it about money and actual commodities <laughs> and not this fucking, like, weird monkey jizz, like, secondary, <laughs> like, economy. What even it... As far as I'm concerned, NFT stands for no fucking thank you. As a number of uh, fans of Lesser's Morgue, have reached out to us and said, it's some Todd shit. Like, it is just that level of comically inept, weird capitalism bullshit. But anyway, now with that valuable bit of context out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the Red Ape family, which is something that I, I wouldn't so much say I watched it as, like, it happened to me. What, like, what was the plot? What actually occurred in this cartoon? I, I like, I remember that... The lion eats people uh, and is offended when people say that that was not that great to do. Uh, there's there's a guy who shoots lasers out of his eyes is the thing that happens at one point. The, the really baffling thing. So we'll talk about the lion for a start because his is the first voice we hear, which is a badly recorded um, thick accent from some kind of African nation, which I would... I would bet money on uh, the voice actor doesn't naturally sound like that, and they just thought it would be funny to give the lion character a uh, kind of pan-African sounding accent. And yeah, his two jokes are vor, 
So it's just like a dire wolf type thing of him just like constantly swallowing people, but without the charm. And uh, actually, no, yeah, the only other joke is the fact that he uh, has a stereotypical Pan-African accent and an African name. And he complains about uh, the fact that he eats people. <laughs> like... Yeah, does it, oh, my cholesterol will go up. Like to call to call any of that a joke is because it's the closest approximation in this of of a joke. Like that's the only yeah, like, like real bit. L- l- let me try at least to express what I think was the plot of this. Um, so our, our main character, <laughs> Chucky, who is the cool ape, and you can tell because he has like a comically like gravelly voice which is badly recorded. Again, that's a running theme. And he has, like, a kind of Fonzie haircut, and he smokes all the time. Personally, I thought they could have made him way cooler if they gave him, like, a dope leather jacket. But, uh, hey, I didn't make it, I guess. He, he and, and this is told non-chronologically, kind of, he uh, goes to some kind of art museum where he steals a really valuable NFT on, like, a golden memory stick. The, the year is... Uh, like twenty, uh, like two thousand one hundred and thirty. By the way, and he he steals this, and a bunch of like cyborg humans and dogs chase him, but he manages to escape because he's so darn cool. He and his uh British wife, Winky, um, escape to Mars on a shuttle called the Musk One, uh, along with. His two children, whose names I've forgotten. Do you remember them? No, fuck no, man. The the kind of stereotypical lion doctor. And one of the weirdest and most inexplicable characters of all. Um, do you want to tell them about the, the skeleton ghosts? Yeah, yeah, because they land... They, they've been hanging out at, like, the bangergames.com uh, <laughs> complex, where I guess they're going to be living well, on Mars. You can only assume he's the dictator of this dystopian future. Bang a game. Exa- and then, in, in, so, th- one of the sons, he was, like, a, the smart son, he's carrying around, like, a... Like a you can tell, because he reads Shakespeare. Y- he's also carrying, like, a, a skull that is not Yorick, but just... He, he says something like, uh, there are forces beyond the wildest control that we cannot possibly understand. There's, wait, yeah. no, there's two Skull guys. There's him. Yeah. And then there's the pilot who who <laughs> takes them to a place who's already a dead, th- bloody skeleton. And then as soon as they arrive, dies again, informing them that, 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 that he was, he died in a previous flight. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm trying to figure out what they were doing with him because... There were just very bizarre elements to all of these characters. Did you notice he had, like, a turban nailed to his skull? I'm assuming this is another, like, one of those, like, shitty characters that you just get the links to. Like, this is another... He must be another token, right? <laughs> yeah. I assume all of them are just like, oh, man. Did you get the latest, like, turban bloody skeleton pilot, man? Bl- yeah, bloody <laughs> turban skeleton. Grand. Yeah, yeah. Like, wh- It's worth 800 monkey jizzes. It's awesome. <laughs> You know what? Here's the thing. If there were any money in this, why does this look like such garbage and shit? Why does this look so awful? Like, yeah. And the thing is, we'll we'll go more into the plot and characters in a sec. But like, we know there's some money behind this because one of the three executive producers is Two Chains. To the best of our knowledge, yes, that Two Chains, the rapper. I can't believe that, like, why, what did he see in this? This is like seeing, like, all those celebrities in Food Fight. Like, it's yeah. like, what is, what, like, what in any part of this convinced 2 Chains that, like, yep, this is a good investment for me, 2 Chains, a man with actual money to get involved in? I can only assume that some, like, uh, fucking, like, greedy-ass, underhanded agent was like, hey, 2 Chains, um... Everyone's getting into all this NFT stuff now. Do you mind if I stick your name on this thing? And uh, then uh, that will help make it super popular. And he's like, yeah, whatever, fuck off. Yo, I, that's likely. That's likely. Because he's one of the executive producers, but there's two others. Like, it, yeah. it could just be like, you know, like, ah, oh, we got two chains to put his name down on this. <laughs> As though that would in any way, like, increase the enjoyment of this nightmare. Hold on, can we talk? Can we also talk about the the fucking yetis? I guess we'll call them 
that that begin yeah, the first this thing, line is devoted to them. They're just these floating blue creatures in space that uh, I guess f- crash into the ship and die and and need to be <laughs> vaporized in order for them to like continue on. I guess like, is is that another NFT? Just these hideous moshy monsters rejects. None of and these things look like, good, dude. None of all of them look real bad. It is the fact that they again, like, if you are someone who likes the idea of owning an NFT, even though you don't do much about it, allow me to present you an awesome alternative. Find an artist you like and just commission them for a piece. Why pay over the odds for a stupid glorified link that hurts the planet when you can support an artist you love and have a cool personalized piece as well? Like, look for an artist you like that has open commissions and reach out. Like, let me tell you, you'll get a much better quality piece of art that is all yours for a lot less money. I'm telling you, dude, I like I saw some iteration of the uh, I studied the blade meme a while ago that featured blockchain on it. And this whole time, I literally thought that blockchain was a technique for blocking all attacks using a like iron chain. No, legit. I, I know the way, it's the one with the, the, the guy with the katana with like the fedora. Yeah. And I thought you the, a blockchain was like a chain that you swing and it like wraps around a sword and you like pull it out of the hands like a sidearm. I gotta be honest, man. I think that sounds a lot more useful than like whatever this is. If this is the end result of yeah. that produces, if it's this, it's if true. it's this nonsense fake currency that depreciates in value, that fucking like you know you lose everything you put into it over and over again, and it runs on these like fucking like gas guzzling terrible servers. Like, what is the fucking point? What 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 is good about this? Like, it's not good art. It's not good for like you don't get rich off of it. It's nothing. It's just fucking nothing. Because all the red apes and like all these NFT apes that you see in general, they just look like really like ugly, basic like you know those like online flash dress up games where you get like a base characters that you can choose the color and like click and drop like accessories on them. Yeah, they all look like that. Yeah, and, like, not even particularly good ones. Oh, God, I hate the way that their mouths move in this animation. Like, and and just the way they move in general. Like, there was that part where, like, the house was shaking, and I thought they were just (laughs) wigging out. (laughs) They were just, like, partying. Like, I didn't know what was happening. Yeah, just going, yeah. that would be on the screen right now. (laughs) It's so you guys ready to boogie? The voice acting is atrocious as well. It's it's awful. Like it's so bad. Uh, the writing isn't particularly anything, and the voice acting doesn't help. Uh... <laughs> I just I just thought if if you wanted to have like a cool like uh, like gangster main character, why not just get two chains to voice him? I, I think that there was a like, limit to how much Two Chains wanted to be involved in this, man. I'm thinking I'm thinking there might have been a limit to how much he wanted to throw behind this. Well, I mean that that's the thing. Like at the end of the day, Two Chains, you know, he knows his way around a recording booth. And I'll put it this way: it could have been worse than the actual result. I mean, yeah, but here's. Th- like they could have left out more letters of detected when they had a sign that says new human no humans descended. <laughs> they just did not give a shit, did they? No. <laughs> like why it's, would they? It's astonishing. Like the the like this is the only animation <laughs> that feels like it fell off the back of a truck. It, yeah. No, for for real. It didn't probably got run over. In the process of it. Like, 20 years ago, this is the kind of thing that you could only buy out of, like, a trench coat. Like, some dude with, like, loads of pockets. Like, if you wanted to buy, like, a really cheap, off-brand, like, DVD for your kids. Like, the thing is, I, I couldn't even see, like, Adult Swim at its lowest point accepting something like this. No, no, this is this is something that, like... The only time you would ever hear of this, something that looked like this and sounded like this and was written like this otherwise, was that, like, 
Mr. Enter did a review of it back in, like, 2015. Like... Oh, you're so right. This has such big, like... The thing is, I think we, we and Mr. Enter would wholly agree on this being absolute trash. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, with, with the kind of, like, political chimera that Mr. Enter is, I don't know what his stance is on NFTs. On, on NFTs, that's so true. But I think if there's a bad cartoon, then immediately his principles are, whatever caused this bad cartoon is the issue. And to be fair, whatever caused this bad cartoon is the issue because <laughs> it would be like like watching oh the uh the like the the happy seal family cartoon and it's just like like six minutes of fart jokes with like an unusually long like two minute credit sequence oh. by the end is like it's sponsored by the seal clubbing foundation i think the biggest sin is that it just fucking ends and you're just supposed to, like, process any of the shit that came before like it had a point. Like, it wasn't just some, like, throw away. This, like, you can't tell me. You can't tell me that the fucking people who made this believed in the artistic merit of this more than they believed in the fucking, like, ah, people are so fucking stupid that they'll, that they'll like, invest in, in fucking red apes because of this shit. This exists on the same internet, in the same moment, as things like A Hell of a Boss and Long Gone Gulch. The, it's an eight-minute video, but it is not an eight-minute cartoon. Generously a six-minute cartoon. And let's be honest, we're never going to see another one, because these, like, crypto dickheads, they never commit. They'll just make something like this. They'll see that it hasn't in any way boosted the value or esteem of... These like garbage red apes, and uh, then we'll we'll never see it again. Because let's be honest, if there were people who wanted to put effort into things that they make money out of, they wouldn't be making NFTs. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And you can tell that from like the nonsensical plot, the shitty dialogue, the fucking god awful like animation. The this is this is such a oh weak... the villains are Laurel and Hardy as well. Oh my god, I almost forgot that they were in this. These fucking, we like... It's literally just Laurel and Hardy. This is just a series of repressed memories, honestly. They spend a half of this godforsaken episode in customs at an airport. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Can you exactly. imagine a less interesting setting? Well, again, I, I personally think Direwolf should sue the lion from this for stealing Vor and misusing it so badly. Henry, we should not sue these fucking people because you know they'll pay us in fucking links to monkeys. <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll settle out of court. Do you accept monkey jizz? Yeah, it, no, I don't accept monkey jizz. I don't accept you. I don't accept this. This is a farce. This economy, this world, this bullshit is a farce, and I'm not taking it anymore. Yeah, it really does put the corn in economics. Oh my fucking jeez. Oh my jizz, man. And and as well, because uh, I know we have a lot of furry fans on this channel, um... I don't want anyone acting like this is a furry thing, because if actual furries were behind this, it wouldn't have looked like shit. Oh, yeah, no, undoubtedly. Because furries know how to draw cool anthro characters. Like, th this is, again, garbage. It's like fucking... It makes dingo pictures look like it has artistic integrity. Oh, jeez. What else is there to say, man? Like, I, I eagerly I, await episode two that proves us all wrong. I can't wait for this one's Lululand I, that, that really yeah, just, like... I was wrong about the Red Ape family. <laughs> there was just so much pathos to the, like, skeleton, like, Sikh pilot guy that they just didn't really show us in episode one. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're right. I don't think there's anything else to say about this. We're going to bring this to an end. Please don't go and watch it. Love yourself. Hearing our descriptions. Don't watch it. Don't invest in NFTs. Uh, anything else, Gus, before we go? Yeah, if you want to leave a comment down there on what NFT actually stands for, wrong answers only, please do, because I, I can't fathom that uh, there could be anything dumber. More worthless than the actual nature of the thing. More bullshit than this. Just fucking... This is making me want to return to actual monkey. It's making me want to return to mercantilism. It's making me want to return home. Because 
For I feel lost. Help me. Ooh, ooh, ah, uh, ah, uh, fuck you. He looks a little bit of like Arcanine from Pokemon. You know, if he was like a like a muscle daddy, like a like an internet daddy. Yeah, if Arcanine dressed like Captain Marvel, this is this is Steve Marmel's Arcanine Captain Marvel. Marvel mommy, mommy meets daddy, and this is their awful inbred child. Meet Super Doge, which is believe it or not a worse NFT cartoon than the Red Ape family. I'm Henry. Uh, Henry, are you sure it's not pronounced super dodgy? Because that's how I feel about every part of this. And I'm Gus. L let me tell you, the things I'm going to say when we get a minute in are not kind. Jesus Christ. So, in, in case you missed it, Gus and I uh, produced a video about the Red Ape family probably a little over a month ago at this point. That was a nightmarish journey into the world of NFTs, which... Just to be clear for anyone who's new here and is like, you know, still kind of holding their breaths about this, we do not support in the slightest. No, they're essentially like millions and billions dollar trading cards that hurt the environment with giant gas guzzling server reserves. Yeah, they are like, they're, they're an idea that is so bizarre and worthless and terrible that they feel like something invented for, like, a heavy-handed Captain Planet villain? As if we've reached a point where now people, because they know they've accepted in their hearts that they can't become billionaires, they need a way to deny it, and so they invented a more complex version of Monopoly money that cost them real money, and, ooh, maybe one of those days, they'll be like any- you'll be like a Bezos or a Musk or any of these other people that they worship for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, it is basically- for anyone who has ever fantasized about what if a pit crew could destroy a rainforest nfts are the product for you so super doge is a horrendous horrendous two part so far cartoon that still manages in its two parts to be significantly like shorter than the red ape family and i want to say for context it really goes without saying that this does not mean that the Red Ape family is anywhere near good, because it's not, it's awful. But it's like, we have taken a bar that was so low, it was on the floor, and we've dug a big hole, and we've thrown the bar down the hole. Yeah, because here's the thing about the Red Ape family, like, nothing happens, it has stupid plot, but enough, like, dumb shit would happen that it would be, that it would seem interesting enough at times. And I'd even say, this is like, weirdly preachy about like, just how cool NFTs are, and how much real money, and people who make money, are bad and greedy people. Which is a really contradictory message, considering that NFTs are a product of greed and exploitation? Yeah, that was incredibly bizarre to me, because it felt like the messaging of this cartoon was deeply confused, so uh, just to give you a little bit of context, because you're seeing the images on the screen, and typically when uh, Gus and I would like cover a piece of media and talk about it, we'd say, oh, go watch it, form your own opinions, but like, genuinely don't give them the oxygen. Like, don't watch it, don't comment on it. Like, just, it's it's worthless, it's antimatter. We're mainly talking about this to kind of like raise awareness and to hopefully in some way lower the value of this clownery by reducing its esteem in people's eyes, but uh, basically the plot is there is Super Doge and uh, his two sidekicks, Hollywood and Lemmy, we'll get to them, and they are superheroes in like a vague NFT universe and they need to stop Fat Cat, who, who is a villain from turning people into NFTs and selling them. But but it's bad when he sells NFTs because he's turning people into them. And also, he cares about selling them, which is bad. <laughs> it doesn't- it doesn't add up. Super Doge is an entertainment debatable and media-based blockchain technology project utilizing NFTs to create positive change and community enrichment. Do you feel enriched, Gus? No, I, I don't. I don't feel enriched, and I don't think that the non-enriched are getting richer. The Super Doge NFT animated series is brought to you by an award-winning team featuring Emmy-nominated lead writer Adam Gillad and an all-star team who are known for their work on X-Men the Animated Series, Gargoyles, VR Troopers, Flight of the Navigator, Once Bitten, and much more, who all now have this irreparably tied to their resume, the poor fuckers. Oh, anyway. I, f 
I feel so bad for all of them to be to be called out like this. Yeah. No, this this is one of those two uncredited. Did you did, speak of the uncredited? Did you look at the credits on this? There is only one person whose name escapes me who is just credited as voice actor and no other voice actors are credited. Okay. So wait, everyone was one voice actor? Surely not. Like, do, do you think the people who did voices for this, which, by the way, the voices are horrendous and they sound like they were recorded in a fucking shed. It's hideous. Do, do you reckon they were all like, yeah, I don't want my name on this. I just need the paycheck. I mean, imagine you record voice for this and they just fucking pay you with a fucking Dogecoin. <laughs> it's like, here, take this down to the local 7-Eleven. Buy yourself a coffee. <laughs> yeah, don't spend it all at once. Here's a Doge. <laughs> or don't spend it at all because it may not have value when you try to spend it. Yeah, but that's such a funny thing about just like cryptocurrency in general. Be like, oh, here's a Doge. Oh, awesome. How much is this worth? Uh, depends on what Elon Musk tweets in the next hour. Yeah, see, here's the thing. It's it's so bizarre that anybody would do anything like this and then, like, shit on real money as opposed to their fake money. This, this is so bizarre because you're right. It, it does have that odd sense of just demonizing the concept of profit, which... Don't get me wrong, you know, Gus and I are both people who would say, hey, it is wrong to make these horrendous, gas-guzzling, ugly monstrosities for profit, or for any other reason, but at the same time, I just am not naive enough to believe that this was made by a gang of, like, NFT true believers who are purely in it for the art. Because if they were in it for the art, it wouldn't be this awful. Yeah, and, and like, listen, like, yes, we are saying that they're hypocrites here, but hypocrisy itself is, like, a weak argument. You also have to prove that the people behind it are doing something more harmful than just something that's against their values. And in the case of NFTs, not only would they be wrong in saying, ah, these greedy people only want to profit, they're also doing the worst version of it. Anyway, let's talk a little bit more about the show itself, because it's ostensibly a comedy which bizarrely it has like again as gus said earlier red ape family would occasionally be like entertaining in a like what the fuck sort of way just from its sheer bizarreness things like uh dr nortiti like voring people all the time and the uh the uh, bloody turban skeleton, skeleton turban. man pilot i love him I'm gonna right click and save him. He's my favorite. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he belongs click to me and save now. Save all of these. <laughs> it's a comedy that plays it bizarrely safe and even steals the same, like, not knowing what NFTs stand for in this. I can't believe the Red Ape family's joke was way more funny. The non fuckable toucan. It was funnier than any of the ones they came up with in this. Yeah, there was Nefarious Felon Terrorist, which uh, Super Doge himself coins. Or, or should I say mince? Oh, yeah, he mints it, yes. Oh, my God. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> now, listen, I feel like, you know, people who do this sort of, like, let's just play straight superheroes who fight against a supervillain, if you're not in the 80s and you're not selling toys... Oh, wait, they are selling toys! I forgot! They're selling a bunch of expensive toys for a bunch of trust fund assholes. Yeah, to boomerang it back around, that was the good YouTube comment I was referring to earlier. It was like, uh, cartoons in the 80s. Hey kids, buy this toy. Cartoons in, uh, 2022. Hey, uh, buy this, like, bizarre, difficult-to-understand link to a JPEG that destroys the world. This is the opposite of Captain Planet. Essentially. Captain Anti-Planet. Should we talk about the characters? Because I actually have some great resources on these. Oh, yeah. Because, well, here's the thing. I think that when it came to the Red Ape family, it was impossible to nail down who anyone was. But with this, they fall into, like, very specific cartoon tropes from, like, the 2000s. It, they're very yeah. cliche characters. And they all suck. And I hate them all. Uh, our three main characters, as I referred to earlier, Super Doge, who is uh, the big barra dog Captain Marvel man there is uh hollywood who was a a cigar chomping chihuahua and then there is lemmy who is a husky and the reason i'm able to say this specifically is not because i'm just really good at animals which is a weird skill to boast it's because they're like very offensive to the eyes website 
has profiles for each one. Are you ready? Oh my god, I can't wait for to hear their, like, how to draw manga-esque profiles. So here's the one for Super Doge himself. Super Doge, the leader of the Doge pack, is a street Shiba Inu with a troubled past, ever ready to lay his life on the line for any fellow animal in danger, unable to look anything but noble and majestic at all times. His greatest weaknesses are fire hydrants and frisbees. Did you feel the episode commu- well, the episodes communicated that? His troubled past? No, and they didn't, like, you know, look into his weaknesses at all, ever. I'm also surprised he's a Sheba because of how, like, yoked he is yeah he doesn't look like a shiba i mean they're compact boys but like he is a, he is huge fundamentally just doesn't look like that breed of dog like it's obviously he is contextually just because dogecoin is the fucking doge me based on thing. the shiba yeah but like god it's embarrassing all right do you want lemmy or hollywood next hollywood because he is just kind of a token minority character that's the whole thing with him oh, i'm just gonna read you the thing because this is the most bizarre of all because they made the very bizarre choice in their first two episodes, which should really be introducing the characters, to have Hollywood trapped as a like looping NFT for the majority of them. That was, yeah, that was unusual. He tries to do something and then gets completely zapped and taken out of the picture. And is just gone until he's back at the end because, again... They didn't know what to do with him. Yeah, no, he's he's just the the th he's the third member of the team. They needed one, you know, just to fill out the roster. There has to be three. They needed the big buff man, the girl, and the other one. So anyway, here's a description: Hollywood, a cigar chomping chihuahua, hails from Eastern Europe, where he used to be a TV child star. Always ready with a quick comeback, usually in the form of a grown out loud pun. Hollywood cares first and foremost about one thing, Hollywood. While constantly making meta comments on the action and the rewriting of the script for his future showbiz comeback, any day now. That, like, literally none of that That just was flat out didn't happen in the show. All of the groanworthy puns came from Super Doge himself because he had, like, all of the lines. Yeah, because Hollywood was trapped as an NFT. Like, that genuinely feels like it came from an older version of the script when he had any kind of characterization other than just foreign yeah yeah he, he is just like i will just say how you say blank or it's good no because the voice acting in this is so atrocious probably the best voice actor in this is lemmy and that's maybe why uh it was only her that was credited because i think it was a uh female voice actor everyone else might be just uh <laughs> the the same person the rest could just be the crew just doubling up because we're gonna get this fucking thing out. But um, no, yeah. Hollywood, his, his actor was so atrocious at actually doing the different accents that initially I thought, oh no, they haven't given him a Mexican accent, have they? And then I thought, wait, French? And then it feels like he eventually slipped into a bit Russian. Like, he, he has the Khajiit accent. Yeah, no, it's a non-specific, weird European accent that fluctuates between Spain, France, and Eastern Europe. Yeah, like, it's, it's like a, almost like an offensive, like, Roma stereotype accent. It is, I'd, I'd say that this character, the thing about him is that, like, he's kind of just offensive to every culture at the same time. Yeah. I didn't know it was possible, but he does a shitty version of everybody's accent. That's, that's his superpower. Anyway, on to Lemmy. Lemmy, a slim husky who likes her fur trim, her nails French, and her clothes not too matchy-matchy, is one really cool bitch. The brain of the group, she has a secret crush on Super Doge that she won't let anyone sniff out. Again, A, the crush is not secret. And B, none of the rest of that is expressed in the episodes. Like, no, never once does she seem smart or, like, conscious about her appearance. To be fair, she is the only one who knows what an NFT actually is. So, like, <laughs> they did give that to her because men make dumb comedy. Women deliver exposition dryly. Yeah, like, that. that's part of why uh, it feels like she has no characterization because... In the overall, maybe generously five minutes of combined actual episode in these two episodes, not counting credits, um, a, a good portion of her spoken lines is just essentially reading the Wikipedia page for NFTs. Yeah, no, and, and she really just doesn't do anything. I mean, none of the characters, with the exception of, like, the 
Super Doge and the weird mentor Rafiki guy. What was his name? I've already forgotten his fucking name. Satoshi. His name's Satoshi, Satoshi for some yeah. reason. Even though he is literally just Rafiki, but he's a genie and he's got a bong. That's his, like, only thing. <laughs> How many Disney characters can we rip off in one character? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like, what? what's that fucking guy from the Power Rangers? Is it Zordon? Zordon, yeah, he's the Zordon. Yeah, he, he's the Zordon. And Super Doge doesn't even <laughs> win the day. But you know what's really funny? So isn't the whole thing with, um, like, NFTs, like, you know, oh, they're one of a kind, unique, non-fungible. They, they beat the villain in the end by Super Doge making a bunch of exact copies of himself? Yeah, what the fuck? He just mass-produced himself. Is this an anti-NFT NFT cartoon? Or are they just that stupid? Uh, here's the thing. If it is an anti-NFT NFT cartoon, it's brilliant satire because it gets everything about the concept wrong. But the problem is, it's also just not entertaining as a show. And it's making NFTs. It's like when uh, John Cleese, who is just embarrassing in every regard these days. Um, oh my god. I'm sorry for every old comedian in your country, because it seems like they all all become shits. Eric Idle is still cool, at least, because he stays in his lane. He, he He's the good British python uh, who isn't dead. But um, that aside, it's like John Cleese, he like made an NFT of the Brooklyn Bridge to like make fun of FF NFTs. But it's like, John, you still made a fucking NFT. It's like robbing a bank while dressed as a clown to make fun of bank robbers. Like, you still robbed a fucking bank, dude. I oh, know that's just the Joker, but... <laughs> that is just the Joker, right? This is turning me into the Joker. I'm Jokerifying. <laughs> yeah, no, literally. Okay, does does Satoshi also have a uh, a profile on here? No, he doesn't. Wasn't important enough. Neither does Fat Cat, oh my God. has the worst mic of all. Yeah, also... Fat Cat, like, attempts humor at several points throughout this, and none of it's funny. It's all really... D He's confused about the fact that he has paws at some point. Then he, like, considers Super Doge's offer of, like, trading all the people he's captured for Super Doge, and he, like, reconsiders it. But none of this is given any, like, t you know, timing or vocal inflection or anything that would mark it as a joke. It's just a guy babbling stupidly in things that might be comedic lines not good ones but if they were delivered by a voice actor they'd be recognizable as jokes yeah like th this whole thing ha is like vaguely gesturing at the cadences of being a generic early 2000s children's cartoon but it has weird it has boner jokes yeah it? well you can't decide what it is it's so holistically strange well holistically terrible honestly because the thing that kept occurring to me is just the immensely bizarre like pauses there was also a part where fat cat was like blasting lasers and as super doge was talking the lasers like drowned out half of what he said so like between the pauses and like the lasers going you just like are like okay okay what is hap what is happening yeah <laughs> and it was a cheesy line too it was like it was like i've got a bone to pick with you <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was like halfway through the voice actor was like are we really doing this and then had to commit yeah no it, it's so weird too because you look at this youtube channel you look at the fact that they set up a website for it and it just feels like everything here is do they do they really think they need to astro astroturf this badly because the red ape family just kind of fucking existed and, like, people will defend it. Like, they don't need to convince people who are already into NFTs that this is worth their investment. Those people, those fuckers will spend their money on anything that's NFT related because they just have no standards. It's just a waste of effort because if you wanted to make something that was, you know, out here to, like, spread the word of NFTs, like, why rush it and make it something this terrible that, like, to the majority of people will just turn them off more because they'll see this and be, oh, is this what NFTs are? This sucks, which they do. So maybe it is just a weird sleeper made to, to fuck over NFTs. Who knows? It's that baffling. It has the, like, President Evil problem of, 
being so inept you can't even tell what it believes. It would be interesting to imagine a version of this that was like a satire against NFTs. But at the end of the day, as it stands, Super Doge is so unentertaining and so bad and so bland in every single thing it does that whatever its intention, it's a waste of time to even comprehend it. And the fact that there's so much money behind it is the truly annoying thing. Do you know who I think the real victim of all of these hideous cartoons are? Furries. These, these are out here giving hard-working, like, furry anthro artists a bad name with its horrendous quality because when you actually give, you know, people who actually know what they're fucking doing with, like, animal character designs a budget to make things, you get really cool shit, which is why I want to propose a new meaning for the acronym NFT. So if someone says to you, hey, do you want to buy an NFT? What you need to say is, nope, furry time. And then you go find a furry artist and you commission them instead. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And if you agree with our movement, I want to see you commenting. I want to see you tweeting. I want to see you yelling from the rooftops. Hashtag nope. Furry time. Nope. Furry time. I love it. I love it. That's so good. Because here's the thing. All I could think while I was watching this was like, uh, whenever Lemmy spoke, I was just like, Luna is way better than you. Luna from Hell's yeah. Boss is like a million times better as a character. <laughs> How dare you stand where she stood. Just shut up. <laughs> we'll feed you to our own wolf OC. Yes. Oh, also, because I, uh, I shouted about it in the other video, but then realized this isn't his thing. If you want a really great uh, furry artist who does uh, all kinds of different stuff, a lot of Vore stuff, uh, Rocket Shark, whose Twitter at is at vorejokes.jpg. Uh, we'll throw a link down in the comments. But yeah, nope, furry time. Mm -hmm. Let's make it happen, people. Yep. Fuck these awful, awful shows. Exactly. <laughs> And uh, until next time, we'll see you in the near future time. Welcome to the Dire Gentleman channel. My name is Gus Zagarella, and everything you're about to hear, to the best of our knowledge, is actually really happening in the year 2022. Yep, you heard it here first. It is not some kind of ridiculous satirical ARG or some nightmarish tulpa we have all made manifest with our collective fears and hatreds. I'm Henry Galley. Welcome to Cryptoland. Oh my god. Goodness gracious. <laughs> D like, this feels like uh, a Jurassic Park situation, but with money falling and plummeting instead of uh, dinosaurs getting out. <laughs> No, there are so many comparisons you can make. This is Jurassic Park. This is uh, Rapture from Bioshock, hence the title. This is Fire Festival. This is Jonestown. Like, <laughs> it's Cryptoland. So to summarize the basic concept of Cryptoland, it is a sort of venture capitalist project buying out an island near Fiji in which all the people who are living that hashtag crypto lifestyle are apparently going to live on the uh, the block chill the blockchain hills where uh where they have um yeah. parcel land and they can just you know work from here and it'll be fine it's a fully functioning island ecosystem and uh, nothing could possibly go wrong yeah the three main areas are the blockchain hills as gus just alluded to and that is the like residential areas that all of the worst people you've ever heard of will be living in the 60 parcels of land i don't know about you but gus but that seemed like a weirdly small amount for the amount of money this place is gonna cost oh i mean you know this is the top of the line the elite but think about it anyone could live in one of those 60 things so that definitely means you who wants to live there it definitely means that you'll get it you're one of the 60 people in the entire world who will get that house what this whole video was predicated on is uh our buddy rocket shark knowing we've done other videos about awful like crypto animations which come up again 
here, like the Red Ape family and Super Doge said, hey, you've got to check this out. This is awful. And essentially, it is this uh, unlisted video by the like Cryptoland creators that it is a kind of surreal 18-minute promotional film for like the concept of this thing that genuinely has to be seen to be believed. That animation is probably what most of this B-roll is going to be made out of, because let me tell you, the animations at your local bowling alley could never. <laughs> So I, I did some research into this. They they never say it out loud in the video, which is weird. That they're very squirrely with a lot of specifics because, in a sense, this video feels more like a like a making of and a puff piece for the horrendous animated short than the concept of Cryptoland itself. Yeah, because you don't you really get a whole lot of details about how all this is going to work, though you do get some details about the budget, maybe information they didn't want to give away up front. <laughs> well, they never say the name of the island. There's a few things where they're quickly showing, like, maps on screen with, like, their different blueprints on it. And I look down into the corner, and the island is uh, Nanuithaki, which is one of the, uh, like, for sale private islands off the coast of Fiji. This guy who was talking about it makes a point of saying, oh yeah, they've already got, uh, like, half a million of their own money invested in this. However, and of course, yeah, they're going to want investment money, they're going to want seed money. Yeah, no shit, they were never going to fund this off their own back. But the island alone is speculated to cost at least 8.5 million. Yeah, so keep in mind, they need to build 60, like, fine parcel land houses on the blockchain hills. They need to build an exclusive club known as the Vladimir Club. <laughs> Which is so sinister. They need to provide, like, vehicles and, like, special, like, resort areas throughout, like, the bay. They've got to, like, staff this place as well. They've got to, I imagine, like, pay millions in taxes with the Fiji government to get all of this shit brokered. Yo, okay, so here's the thing. If there are 60 homes in the, uh, the blockchain hills, where do the workers live? Do they have to fly <laughs> in every day from the mainland? <laughs> that would cost such a comical amount of money. Do, do they live in, like, a giant underground complex beneath the island like parasite yeah here's the thing genuinely henry imagine being someone who's not like a crypto land resident like a crypto king having to work here wouldn't that be like the worst why would anyone sign themselves up for that yeah you're waiting hand and foot on like the worst people the worst genuinely if it, it feels like sort of every five to ten years some like libertarian schmuck will try to just do Bioshock. And the thing is, before anyone, like, uh, points this out in the comments, we know that, like, the actual, like, source of this before Bioshock is mother of all shitheads, Ayn Rand's book, <laughs> Atlas Shrugged, uh, where they have the, uh, the utopian location of Galt's Gulch, where all of the industrialists and rich people run off to to show all the parasites how worthless we'd all be without them. And because it's a work of fiction, it somehow, like, works and completely flips the world's priorities on their head. <laughs> Whereas in real life, it has literally never worked. It will always be a disaster. Uh, these people will fucking eat each other. They're gonna turn into crypto splices, and this will be, like, a, a zombie death island. Well, again, yeah, it's it's just like Fire Festival, where like you know the image of Fire Festival was like, oh, it's gonna be all these influencers and there's gonna be all this music, it's gonna be great food, and then what it ends up being is like a storm that that like supermodels are wandering around in, like dazed and confused, <laughs> devouring their fans. <laughs> and much like Fire Fest, Ja Rule will probably be there. We know two chains will. <laughs> two chains, yes, Mister Master of the Red Ape family himself. <laughs> so shall we get into essentially the um what is a propaganda cartoon for this place that doesn't <laughs> exist yet the, the, the whole time i kept thinking about the like dna cartoon from jurassic park it's so shared that vibe oh my god well the, the whole thing is i just again i just pictured people being like burnt at the stake 
next to a giant effigy of Connie the Coin Man, who so wants to be Robin Williams' genie, to the point that they even just sing an awful parody of Prince Ali at one point after singing a Grease parody? Yeah, no, they do the one that I want, but they change enough of the lyrics and sing it just enough out of key that it wouldn't get them into legal trouble. The, the, the people behind this are so far gone because they keep saying shit like, oh, you know, we're, we're going to take the metaverse and pull it into the physical world. And it's like, dude, that's just real life. That is just what real life is. We've always had this. You are building a resort with condos. This whole thing is just a fucking timeshare scam. It's baffling, too, because they keep saying, like, yeah, we're going to, like, bring the metaverse into the real world. We're going to reinvent the crypto lifestyle. And it's like, money already exists. The economy already exists. It, be it begins with our, our protagonist, uh, Christopher, who, again, just looks like Dream from the fucking Dream mask video. He is greeted, like, right on the runway by... <laughs> His old friend, Connie, who, as we've alluded to before, is the nightmarish, like, bowling alley animation coin mascot of this whole sordid affair. All reality goes out the window immediately here because he's, like, talking to this coin guy as if it's, like, his best friend. This coin man is a magical genie who will give you everything you want, but we're also supposed to believe that, oh, everything else other than the talking coin is just how it's going to be. It'll be this good, but there won't be a talking coin, but you'll feel like you're friends with this talking coin, you know? But it's far crazy than that because there's a talking seagull. The cars yell to the moon. That's right, they do, and they dance to the music. This has the like, this has like a DreamWorks ending of a movie of a 2000s DreamWorks movie dance party. And and you know why I bet they did that? This whole thing feels like a masterclass in like legal ass covering because it's like you know you you can't take fully seriously that we promised like X or Y location or amenity. I mean. There were talking coins and birds and cars in this. Clearly, it wasn't meant to be a one-to-one -one representation of the final product. But it's still propaganda. Oh, 100%. It's still just, like, talking up their product, which, again, does not exist. They've CGI constructed all of these environments when they haven't even started building any of this stuff. No, it's true. Like, th this place, it it's why it feels like such a perfect, like, grim satire of, like, late capitalism and the world we live in. Everything in this place is themed on crypto. Everything. Like, the, the menu. That the they have, like, 10k pizza. And, like, what else? You, you, you remember some of it, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah, there was the Atomic Swap Lemonade. There, there was like a, like a Twitter verified pasta or some shit. This is just so embarrassing. Imagine like your hobby being this much of your personality that you need to live on an island where you physically cannot escape from it. Never truly rest. Fucking Sigma Male grind set. Never stop. <laughs> Give your life to this. When he gets into this island as well, it's first this like truly deranged tour where Connie is showing him around. But... There is also a love story. That's right. There's a romance here. You can find love on this island. In fact, you will. That's a feature of the island. I think what is happening here is this is a big setup for a pump and dump. We've seen it with ridiculous coins like uh, Squid Game and the even more absurd Monkey Jizz that we brought up back in the Red Ape family. It's all just this big stupid publicity stunt to raise the value of either like a coin or like a set of NFTs that I'm sure they're selling based on this. And they do the thing they always do. They pump it up, pump it up, pump it up, sell, and then fucking dive bomb out when the value plummets and leaves some fucking idiot hold in the bag. That is always how this goes. And I guarantee it's how this will go. And to be honest, that is the favorable outcome because if this actually happens, people will die. It is literally the smartest and safest option for them to pump and dump. They'll make money and then they won't have to invest so much in building this like extremely complicated island, which like a Saudi billionaire would try to like do in Dubai and then run out of money halfway through. Yeah, because that's how this shit always happens. It's why... None of these, like, stupid libertarian fantasy islands 
ever actually happen. There are so many considerations that they haven't taken into account here. For example, natural disasters. Fiji is pretty famous for its monsoons. And ironically, it's the kind of problems that shit like crypto mining exacerbates. So it's a perfect case of being like done in by their own hubris if these bitches end up getting fucking tsunamied off this goddamn island. Yeah, actually, here's the thing. If you wanted to build some kind of like crypto NFT paradise, you you need to do it like in the tallest mountain. Like in the like <laughs> you have to create some kind of like mountain fortress where you can hide away yeah. for until like the rest of the world floods over and there's no trees. <laughs> like they're going about this the wrong way. They're 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 literally settling in the places that they are rendering obsolete because they just need their apes so badly. Henry, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about a few other things on the island that they show them. There is a, a a pyramid, which is a fucking memorial to BitConnect. Which was that conference with that weird, uh, like, Mimi BitConnect guy that uh, John Oliver made fun of, that on the inside is, like, an, an arcade. But, like, fuck off that they're building a statue to that guy outside and then building a whole ass pyramid. Like, why would you do this? <laughs> What's so funny is... This, like, like decision to use ancient Egyptian imagery just made me think of Percy Shelley's Ozymandias. <laughs> They're like, look upon my works, ye mighty in despair, to, like, an ocean of sand. It's just so funny, too, because, like, they're like, look, we've got this, like, crazy huge arcade, and also a nightclub, and a place, like, a restaurant, and it's like, w what about a grocery store? Where's the food coming from? Or what about, like, a fi the fire department, for example? <laughs> like, where's the, the hospital? hospital? Fair enough if they want to make a society without police. We don't need those fuckers. But, like, everything <laughs> else is essential if you want to create a community. Th there needs to be, like, a pantry or something. What's going to happen in the end is... These fucking morons will end up becoming, like, the Fiji government's problem. I'm just imagining a gang of, like, Mad Max people wearing, like, NFT masks and taking over the restaurant and being like, no one gets food until they pay the crypto toll. It's so funny to me because a, a running thing in everything we've covered in all of our crypto videos is there is always something that feels like it is so counterintuitive to what is, like, the supposed benefits of NFTs. Like, you know, in the Red Ape family, there was the, like, golden memory stick in in Super Doge, there's the fact he replicates himself. In this, people's crypto wallets are attached to their fucking room keys? And they even, that's even a plot point in the romance story! A seagull steals it! You can get your Bitcoin stolen! <laughs> it is physical object on this island! What's to stop some mad person from running down the blockchain hills and stealing everybody's <laughs> wallet? No, legit. This place, like, every, every fucking pirate within, like, a thousand miles. <laughs> like, and, you know, you know, not the Yara or y Ahoy Me Hearties pirates. I'm talking, like, the scary motherfuckers with, with machine AK guns. Yeah. The, like, Captain Phillips type dudes are going to be on this place like flies on shit, gunning these yuppie morons down and stealing all of it. Exactly, like, forget forget it like a security force. You need a private army to defend this place. <laughs> Anyone could swoop in and steal their physical crypto wallets. Again, yeah, the very idea of physical crypto wallets defeats the whole point of this idea of, like, decentralized, secure blockchain that, like, can't be stolen. Like, this is genuinely one of the dumbest ideas ever. And what I love is that if this were, like, a fictional story like a sci-fi dystopian story or even an episode of black mirror everyone would complain about the plot holes in the world
world building. This is legitimately the crypto version of all of those, like, old posts about, like, Tumblr University and Tumblr Island back in the pre-Dashcon days. But these fucking morons are actually trying to build it. You could build Dual Academy Island from, from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and have trading cards be the currency, and it would be more stable than this. But this is so absurd. Like, I would genuinely believe it if, like, their presence here awoke some fucking, like, ancient forest deity of the island. Just this gigantic stone deity who's just like, Give me your treasures! All your yeah. riches belong to us! And they hand over the crypto wallets, and he's like, What the fuck is this? I'm destroying the what entire world these? now. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> What are these? And he's like, Well, actually, I think it's this uh, decentralized blockchain technology, and he vomits lava onto them. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, it's a metaverse. It's, a, it's an earth that's outside of the earth. Which, by the way, uh, another thing that just, like, felt like an element of satire is, like, the, the woman of the duo being like, yeah, we put a lot of consideration into, like, finding a way that Cryptoland could uh, really co- like, be, be like a really eco-friendly place. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? You better commit to, like, you know, some aspect of this being eco-friendly, because in 20 years, you'll be underwater! Yeah, the, the fact is, something like this is never going to be viable, it's never going to be taken seriously, until they reduce its, like, detrimental environmental impacts and gas costs and make it something that's stable. And the, the, the fact that this place is full of shit called Dogecoin and monkey jizz and all of that shows <laughs> this is never going to be currency for real people. It is a set of scams. Like, th there was a time in the past where it felt like, hey, maybe one day Bitcoin which at least sounds like a real coin, will become a thing if they figure out how to address all the problems we've just discussed. But like anything new, when people saw blood in the water, immediately the fucking scam artists come in, and it's all the scammers and the scammies, and we're just here like being covered in the shit from their doo-doo asses while they do their stupid fucking crypto scat play off on shit boy island yeah exactly but you know there was a legend once of a man named gold doger and he left all of his <laughs> bitcoin wallets in one place and so a young a young pirate named monkey d jizz set out <laughs> for the grand line <laughs> Dreamin', yo, yo, don't give yo, it up, yo. Elon dreamin', <laughs> don't give it up, 2 Chains dreamin', don't, don't give it up, up Super Toast dreamin', don't, don't give, it up, give it up, give it up, give it up, ah! Here's how the story goes, we find out by the treasure in the grand line, there's no doubt, the pirate whose eye is on it, he'll sing, I'll be king of the pirates, I'm gonna be king. Welcome to the Dire Gentleman channel. My name is Gus. <laughs> and I'm Henry. And welcome to our trippy synesthesia world. <laughs> the world oh. of Razzle Khan, history's most prolific thief <laughs> and worst <laughs> rapper. <laughs> this is, so so we, we've done a few videos about like weird stuff connected to crypto. And uh, mm -hmm. our kind of niche in this world is guys who are not by any means crypto experts. Basically, wherever crypto intersects with art, we started our little, like, you know, journey into crypto-adjacent um, horrible art with the Red Ape family. The Red Ape family does not go nearly as hard as these videos. No. So, Heather Morgan, aka Razzle Khan, uh, the internet's weirdest rapper, her and her husband, Ilya Dutch Lichtenstein, have uh, been implicated a plot to launder by latest count just over five billion dollars of Bitcoin that was stolen in the 2016 Bitfinex hack. Um, the, the trial is ongoing, so we're gonna have to throw in a bunch of allegedlies on this. <laughs> but um, this is genuinely one of the strangest things I've ever seen, because the, the internet is obviously, um, you know, it, it's not starving for uh, videos about Razzle Khan. I, I think we are doing something a bit different here by going deeper than anyone else into Razzle Khan's nightmare dis discography. She is the rapper who 
in terms of her, like, lyrics and music videos, is the least gangster. But in terms of her actual alleged crimes, maybe the most gangster rapper of all time? She has stolen so much money, allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's Bitcoin, so, like, even then, the, the money that she's stolen is, like, alleged money. <laughs> In, in, in a sense. <laughs> and the thing is, these two are so weird and so stupid. When we first found out about this, I said to make uh, Heather slash Russell Khan and Dutch feel like a pair of like Coen Brothers characters. To give you an idea, when their like apartment was raided by the FBI, they found a bunch of flip phones in sandwich bags. Like, Ziploc bags labeled burner phone. <laughs> Which is a thing a normal person does, and certainly nobody who's involved in crimes. It, it's Characters in fiction don't even have, like, ah, yes, these were the burner phones. As you can see, clearly they've been labeled here at the burner phone. Well, yeah, because that defeats the point of a burner phone. The whole point of a burner phone is it's something that you can, like, destroy quickly. So it doesn't, like, lead back to you. It, it's why they're so often flip phones, because they're cheap and you can just snap them. <laughs> but they just, they just didn't burn the phones. We're going to talk about um, Heather today, because Dutch doesn't seem nearly as interesting. An accessory to the, to the Versace Bedouin, the, the <laughs> motherfucking crocodile of Wall Street. Yeah, like, maybe he was the heart of the crime, like, the financial crimes, but he's only an accessory to the musical crime. <laughs> <laughs> which are very <laughs> steep crimes in their own right. <laughs> they truly are. There is there is a lot to answer for. Henry and I watched like five of these Razzle Khan music videos, and this is less a like commentary and review of Razzle Khan's music and more us attempting to exercise the horrible bad vibes that, that seeped into our body through all of our senses as we endured them. Yeah, no, truly, we are invited to her, quote, trippy synesthesia world because this is genuinely an assault on, like, every sense. I, I felt like I could smell these videos. <laughs> they did not smell good. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, so, Fazachi Bedouin is the one that, like, everybody... Yeah, also known as the Crocodile of Wall Street, because that's the most bizarre lyric in it. And part of uh, Razzle Khan's kind of running obsession with, with crocodiles as a species... Yeah, I don't... Crocodiles and alligators. It's it's both of them. Because in the social distance one, yes, there is a song about social yeah, distancing. we'll get to it. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was an alligator on, like, a sign. So it's like, it doesn't really matter whether it's a crocodile or an alligator. It's just those types of animals are the ones that appear in all of her stuff. Another strange idiosyncrasy. In many of these, she's just wearing fanny packs. Yeah, no, she, she's wearing fanny packs. The, the outfit she wears throughout these videos, there was one that I was watching and I was like, holy fuck. It, it was the uh, vacuum cleaner <laughs> music video. It sounds like we're ad-libbing this. We're really not. But she's like shirtless and wearing like star shaped nipple pasties it yeah it was like it was like you know basically like burlesque pasties um in this video about how like her friend sucks like a vacuum cleaner and that's why she's dropping them yeah and and another weird idiosyncrasy and this is that's gonna haunt my dreams i imagine there's a good chance it's in the thumbnail but this face <laughs> That she pulls the looks as though she's having some kind of like cerebral event. Girl light gate boss gas keep. <laughs> the massive gas keep energy of these videos. More like gas leak energy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> she she did a talk back in the day called How to Social Engineer Your Way into Anything. And uh, can I read you the description of this talk? Incredible, yes, please. <laughs> Social engineering is the act of manipulating someone into divulging information or taking a particular action. While it often has a negative connotation in cybersecurity, there are many less sinister instances where you can use it to improve your life, from dating and job hunting to journalism, sales and entrepreneurship. 
for hear firsthand how Heather R. Morgan social engineered her way into exclusive parties and expensive political fundraisers, infiltrated black markets around the world, and built relationships with celebrities and billionaire CEOs. You'll learn actionable tactics for event crashing, how to cold email even the most reclusive and high-level people and get a response, and what to do to get yourself out of a jam. This, again, just feels like the classic, like, Mr. Police, I gave you all the clues. Yeah, it's so funny how she's just saying, like, you can literally lie and cheat your way into anywhere and then steal everything. <laughs> Not rap talent, though. That's one thing that you actually kind of have to be good at definitively she has not been able to social engineer people into thinking that these videos are good this is this is razzle khan's website which i'm sure there are screen caps on the screen right now this is how she describes herself razzle khan the infamous crocodile of wall street strikes again more fearless and more shameless than ever before She's taking on everyone from big software companies to healthcare to finance bros. Razzle Khan is like Genghis Khan, but with more pizzazz. No one knows for sure where this rap is from. Could be the North African desert, the jungles of Vietnam, or another universe. All that matters is she's here to stick up for misfits and underdogs everywhere. We do know that she's descended from a nomadic tribe, though. Which which one? Because she is the whitest woman I have ever seen. She's the last airbender. We found her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last earbender. Oh, she bends your ears into uh, an, an irreconcilable shape. <laughs> because Raz has synesthesia, her art often resembles something in between an acid trip and a delightful nightmare. Definitely not for the faint of heart or easily offended. <laughs> Raz likes to push the limits. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, the music does offend me. Uh, yeah, no, I was I was incredibly offended by it. <laughs> Raz, Raz likes to push the limits of what people are comfortable with. Her style has often been described as sexy horror comedy. No, she's coming for our brand, Henry. Our brand. What we're most known for outside of YouTube is Lesses Borg, our horror comedy podcast. So I feel like, you know, we're somewhat of an authority on horror comedy and like, this is horrifying, uh, as you've probably seen from the B-roll on the screen, but it's not horror because of her fondness of combining dark and disturbing concepts with dirty jokes and gestures. Just like her fearless, entrepreneurial spirit and hacker mindset, again, she gave us all the clues. Raz shamelessly explores new frontiers of art, pushing the limits of what's possible whether that leads to something wonderful or terrible is unclear. Hmm, I wouldn't quite uh, say. Unclear, unknown to many. Who, <laughs> the, who can really say? The only thing that's certain is it won't be boring or mediocre. As we know from her lyrics in Versace Bedouin, Raz is not just a rapper. She is also a software CEO, a writer, an economist, and a few contradictory other things. Parenthesis, listen to find out who we did. Well, Raz has many <laughs> rappers that she is inspired by, including South African rap duo D. Antwood, Tierra Wack, and rapper Mickey Avalon, which is really funny because so many of these people have kind of like awkwardly like milkshake ducked in different ways. She also finds great inspiration of the creative works of Salvador Dali, Diane Arbus, Hunter S. Thompson, Roald Dahl, and Charles Bukowski. I mean... I think the Hunter S. Thompson thing tracks. I'm definitely feeling a combination of fear and loathing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's very true. I, it's it's so funny, like hearing all these different influences and like she embraced the concept of weirdness in her music. The, the one genuinely valuable lesson to take from Rizal Khan, other than like delete your cringe before you do the heist of the millennium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is um people like anyone can genuinely like just say anything about like the quality of their work because like uh for example a lot of what was said there i feel like you could accurately um put to um a artist that gus and i really enjoy uh will wood mm. a lot of that would accurately describe him you know the themes of like social commentary mixed with horror and dark comedy elements and Mixing styles and pushing the boundaries. By the way, if you haven't, check out the normal album. It's great. But literally anyone can say that about themselves. Like, I, I could write a profile where I'm like, oh, yes, uh, Henry Galley has the visual art skills of uh, Da Vinci, uh, Van Gogh, Renoir, and Michelangelo. 
uh, even though I can't, like, paint or sculpt. But th there's nothing stopping me from saying that. Yeah, I mean, and, and for me personally, you know, one of my greatest influences was Albert Einstein. That's why I'm so much smarter than him. <laughs> yeah, so we started with this, we allude to Versace Bedouin. What I want to talk about most is, like, the music video itself and just these, like, insanely, like, awkward, uncoordinated, like, background dances. Yeah, they're just kind of, like, following her as their main dance move is just, like, walking forward. They're doing the Mario. They're swinging their arms from side to side. Come on, everyone, do the Mario. They're, they're just kind of walking in, like, a, a bizarre, like, kind of flamboyant fashion yeah and just the, the whole time she's doing like you know just the moves that i guess are dance moves with the fanny pack which is just like why do you need the fanny pack for the music video you're not storing things there that are going to be needed for this is that a fashion statement it's the one of the worst ones ever <laughs> 10 rappers that eminem was afraid to diss she stole all of eminem's bitcoin <laughs> she's hiding the bitcoin in the fanny pack if she unzips the fanny pack a beam of light comes out that turns you into an nft yeah <laughs> she's uh what was it was it fat cat the mad catter who's one of the fat cats in um why do i know so much super doge lore help <laughs> <laughs> i i personally can't wait to see if she ever like gets out of jail uh, a razzle card and two chains collar. You mentioned earlier the like um, vacuum cleaner one. There are two versions of that. There's one which is just the regular music video with just the lyrics, her sucking up like pistachio shells with a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. And then there's a weird one that has it looks like um, George Lucas got to it and just <laughs> added a bunch of like weird CG creatures. Yeah, razzle card is trying so hard to be this like kind of weird core artist and like she is just a great example of at a certain point you do need talent or skill that song the the point of it is just her like very poorly talking about like a, a friend or connection she has and just being like yeah you talk about yourself all the time and you're kind of lame and you imagine suck. being too annoying for razzle khan here's the thing if somebody if somebody i was like friends with made something like suck like a vacuum cleaner and showed it to me and said we're not friends anymore <laughs> i'd look at that and be like i'm glad we like i don't think we were ever friends if if that was inside of you yeah, for, for the love of god don't associate me with this this is like finding out that like oh we, we just unearthed a book of al capone's really cringy poetry it's wild too because like the the rap songs they all attempt kind of like i think they're trying to go for like some kind of like social commentary but it's never clear what Razzle Khan's actually talking about in them. L like a lot of people who don't really have anything to say, they they mainly just sort of campaign against this uh, like this vague idea of like fakes or like normies or whatever. Like yeah, and there's really there's really like nothing else to it. Like that's that weird like California Rolls song where she's just oh. she's just. She speaks Japanese in it. She speaks Japanese in it. And, and the whole thing, I guess, was about, like, white people appropriating Japanese food and not making good sushi. But she's the whitest woman ever. Like, Heather Morgan might be the whitest and name ever. And she's speaking Japanese. And, and the thing is, at the end of the day, this is just a song about, like, how she's mad that a lot of the California sushi isn't that good. And it's like, that's not a, that's not a real problem. That's not a social ill. Just go to better sushi places or ones that like aren't run by white people if that's your core issue yeah that, that that's the funny thing it's like despite thinking she's a widow and like don't, don't get me wrong in many regards she is a huge widow <laughs> yeah. in, in in the actual like opinion she holds she is such a like basic blue check liberal the, 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 this whole thing of in her incredibly painful and tasteless social distance song Despite her telling people, like, stay indoors and social distance, like, so much of the music video is her, like, pissing about outside. But but that aside, like, she she has this, like, really painful uh, character in it, also played by her, called uh, Charlene, who is uh, meant to be, like, a redneck. And she's just, like, you know, her, her main thing of this, like, Charlene character is, like, oh, she is, she is a lot lizard. Which is a term for sex workers who provide sex to uh, truckers on trucking lots. And her saying, like, oh, if I wear a mask, I can't give blowjobs. And it's all just this really, like, 
classist, like, slut shamey stuff that's just super gross that that's the thing it's always just kind of tasteless but it doesn't really get at anything like all of razzle khan's problems are my friend kind of sucks or i got bad sushi or i have to quarantine like everyone else yeah it's peak quote unquote first world problems yeah and then like the other genre of like razzle khan song is like Look at me, I have cool stuff. It does come back to this real thing of absurdly rich people who are wealthy and comfortable, desperately wanting to seem like a weird outsider when they're about as insider and status quo as they can possibly be. And yeah, it's also just like a bunch of like hierography because like the weirdness and like the like eccentricity cannot mask the fact that like Razzle Khan can't write good lyrics or like rhyme them well or perform well at all. Look, th that, that's a that's a key thing actually because like obviously I'm not an expert but I know enough like basic music theory to know one of the key elements of successful rapping is flow and she doesn't fucking have it. There are times where like the the word choice will just be so like that was not the way to continue that sentence. Russell Khan's lyrics feel like falling down an up escalator, just this repeated like getting whacked in the face of like, oh wait, that? Because uh, uh, it's just one bizarre creative choice after another. Like, <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. Well, one of the, the repeating lyrics in uh, Versace Bedouin came a long way, don't know where I'm going. I have an idea. Russell Khan. We know, I think we know where you're going now. Yeah. G Gus and I have put ourselves through some shit. We listened to five of these songs. We'll put a link to the like the, the five <laughs> songs in the thing if you want to torture yourself. Oh. But we need a little bit of music therapy. <laughs> so if you've made it this far in the video, what I would really love you to do is to go down to the comments and uh, suggest an underrated artist that you love. Maybe like one or two of their songs or an album that you really like and you wish more people would try. So uh, we get some actual good music up in this, and oh, we, we yes, shed some please. light on My some, on some great you. artists. Yeah, no, we're begging you. If, any genre, any like type of music from any era, if you love them, let us know. Introduce them in the comments, because we'll definitely check them out. Gus and I love music. We're always checking exactly. new stuff out. Exactly, and we're eclectic. We're weirdos. We'll take any genre. We're the muck... <laughs> Fucking crocodiles <laughs> of YouTube. But yeah, I'm yeah, like... Ha have some fun. Geek out. Gosh, tell us why you love them. We'll check them out and have a good time. And if you're down there in the comments, be sure to read other people's comments and check out their suggestions because at the end of the day, we can't just reward bad behavior. Yeah, it can't just be like, uh, well, this this like this obscure bad rapper with terrible music is now being known about because they committed a huge crime. Yeah, like, exactly. That, that is it's rewarding it's rewarding bad unremarkable art uh for like a completely unrelated like uh a criminal action and it it's a bad precedent to set but then again Razzle Khan has set all sorts of She's bad precedents of both bad in precedents. terms of rap stealing more money than ever stolen before i shudder at at the day that either in the rap world or in the uh in the in the thievery world that someone will be like ah Razzle Khan walked so that this person could run. <laughs> <laughs> this person could run from Razzle Khan. <laughs> I think we'll all be running. Hey, Henry. Yeah, Gus? I'm starting to think this whole NFT craze might not be the best idea. <laughs> oh, no, Gus. I just think you're not going to make it. And me uh, and the rest of all of the winners are, are going to make it and we'll all be filthy rich. Just like the guy at Herbalife told me, my ship's going to come in any day now. <sighs> How is there a second episode of the Red Ape family? How was this not an elaborate rug pull yet? <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, it's been a while since we made our first video, and um, it did well. It was what honestly started us talking about the bizarre intersections of uh, NFTs and art. It just feels like the, the, the simulation of reality keeps breaking down and getting stranger and stranger, because while... Conceptually, morally, ethically, the very existence of the Red Ape family and all it represents is unquestionably a bad thing, because NFTs suck, they're a scam, and all that other stuff. We would be remiss to say that episode 2 of the Red Ape family in several ways isn't higher quality 
than episode one? Because it is. Yeah, as writers, we have to acknowledge that there's better structure here. The characters are a bit more defined. The world is a bit more defined. It's, uh, it, it, the bar is high enough for us to trip over it. Yeah. As human beings, though, <laughs> we can still be repulsed by everything that this piece of art stands for. We just have to call it art in the process. Yeah, exactly. So th there's a number of things um, I want to get to today. The first is some good news. NFTs really do seem to be on their way out. Did you hear about the, the first tweet debacle, Gus? Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> I, I believe Jack Dorsey um, minted and sold off the first ever tweet for $2.9 million dollars to a uh like a, a collector of such things and since then he has put it on the resale market um hoping to get 48 million dollars on it through like accumulated value right which always works yeah of course <laughs> you know so you know when you drive a car off the lot it suddenly uh doubles in value right mm -hmm. oh always so gus I would like you to guess what the top bid um, that was on this uh, like first tweet when this guy put it up for resale. What do, what do you think the top bid was? I'm going to say this might be lowballing it, but is it under $100? You lowballed it a little bit, but it is under $300. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that is one of the most <laughs> catastrophic losses I have ever heard of. Oh my god. The Red Ape family being back feels like such an anomaly because in all these other cases, there's lost value. There's like, they'll just abandon projects like Cryptoland. We're never hearing of that. Oh, there's 100%. Connie NFTs, worthless now. The, the fact that this came back and now has what seems to be a budget, meaning that the first episode made some kind of profit for these horrible red apes. It's, it's just baffling, man. It really is. It really, really is. What it feels like to me is... You know that bit you'd see in, like, every Wally e. Coyote and Roadrunner Looney Tunes short, where Wally e. Coyote, like, overshoots chasing the Roadrunner and runs right off the edge of a cliff, but until he looks down, he's still just sort of running on air because he just hasn't, he hasn't realized he's gone off the edge of the cliff yet, and it's only when he realizes that he'll finally, like, tumble down to his doom. That's what the, the Red Ape Family Episode 2 feels like yeah because i think they just are so firmly not looking down like th this feels like people actually believe in it in a very strange way <laughs> genuinely genuinely like i i, I want to know if two chains who does seem to other than making the occasional tweet about it literally only uh seem to be there for like funding and a little bit of name recognition because i don't believe he has any part in the directing writing um i don't think they even use any of his music for it which is is bizarre because you'd think you know if you had access to like a pretty well-known musical artist you'd want to use their stuff wouldn't you yeah well wait does he do the opening theme or who does the opening theme I, I don't know and i don't care enough to check myself so if you're watching this please let us know who does the opening theme uh down in the comments and whether or not it's two chains <laughs> <laughs> yeah please let's talk a little bit about the episode itself now do you want to get us started off on that gus well yeah because we were almost in this episode in a weird twisted way yeah but they like... they left us out they disincluded us we we the reason this video is um slightly later out than our videos usually would be is um we got into a bit of a copyright kerfuffle with chuck wendig which we ended up winning because our seven hour video on him has since being uh, since been reinstated and the strike has been removed from the channel but at the time we thought oh shit considering that now we know they don't really take criticism that well we probably shouldn't fuck with the Red Ape family in case they uh, copyright strike us as well and put us in a really precarious position, which is why we waited for the Chuck w uh, Wendig video to be reinstated. But from the very beginning, when we saw it come out and we saw the, um, you know, they obviously had the most direct disc to Saber Spark, which makes sense. 
He is um, a way bigger YouTuber than us, and is is a really cool guy as well. Um, Meg has actually um, worked on um, his like multi animator projects, like the one for Joshua and the Promised Land. But yeah, they they had a montage of all the critical videos, didn't they, at the start? And we weren't in it. You know, far be it for me to to have like you know NFT enemies on our tail. That's that's <laughs> you know, <laughs> but. But come on, some credit where credit is due. We did make the video. <laughs> yeah, no, personally, because the thing is, it's not that we can't take a joke. We're upset that you didn't make fun of us. We want to t be, be at the expense of your jokes. I mean... Notice us, senpai. People already say sometimes that our little icons look like NFTs of us, so we're, we're pretty close. You know, what can our little uh, lizard and Frankenstein guys in there? They can just be background characters. Maybe you can have, like, Chucky, like, shoot one of us in the head. Or something, you know, at least some recognition. There's an alternative one of me that's a skeleton from the old video. You could put that guy yeah. flying a plane and it will be all set. Yeah, exactly. Like Gus in a somewhat culturally insensitive turban flying a plane <laughs> and covered in blood. No, no, they just they just put me in a chef's hat and my hand would always be like curled up in an okay. Yeah, like, like a big mm, like curly mm, moustache. Because they've got to have me. like the, the weird racial stereotypes. Which, by the way, they lampshade. In this episode with Dr. Noatiti? Yeah, okay, so simultaneously, we were talking about this a little bit off mic, simultaneously it seems like Red Ape Family Episode 2 took criticism in the best way possible in that they improved and took some things in stride and corrected some things, and they also took it in the worst way possible by insulting their critics, by, like, doubling down on certain things, and by, like aggressively just leaning in to all of the shitty things that are part of the product's identity. Yeah, in an incredibly petty fashion. Like, what, what I compared it most to off mic is uh, Tails Gets Trolled, which is another thing that, like, you know, made it in a very amateurish way and made mainly out of spite with uh, the, the creator wanting to, like, lash out and vent frustrations at people trolling them. They even in this episode do the, like, incredibly basic, um, all of the trolls are virgins living in their mother's basement type shit. But, like, it, it, in a way, it also becomes oddly compelling in its strangeness, and that definitely applies to both Tales Gets Trolled and Episode 2 of the Red Ape Family. Oh, I mean, you know, from what I know of Tales Gets Trolled, it's one of the greatest shonen anime ever written. It is. <laughs> Red Ape Family, not so much. No, it isn't. But what I want to kind of clarify here is, um, a lot of people were very confused when we said that um, Super Doge is... Uh, a much worse, like, show than the Red Ape Family, when in some ways it's more technically competent. And that's because Super Doge was, yeah, I guess in some ways somewhat technically competent, but was so incredibly, like, milk toast and boring. You, you can very, um, like, correctly throw a lot of uh, insults at the Red Ape Family, but it's never dull. And I would take something that is weird and terrible, but, like, compelling in its strangeness over something that's competent, but, like, you can fucking feel your eyes rolling into the back of your head while you're watching it. The, the, like, some of just the fight scenes in this episode two of the Red Ape family were some of the most bizarre things of, like, you know, people just falling all over the place and being weirdly paced. Uh, Hell of a Boss episode six, this isn't. No, <laughs> Hell of a Boss episode any, this isn't. No, definitely, definitely. So to kind of get into like the, the brass tacks here, what, what's kind of interesting about this as like a piece of like writing, which makes it a lot more competent, because obviously, you know, writing is mine and Gus's wheelhouse. We are the two professional writers of YouTube. No matter what some very angry <laughs> commenters say. There are jokes this time, dude. There were actual jokes that they wrote into this episode. But not just jokes. This episode had subplots, too. Because the main plot of the episode is the um, uh, Hunky, one of the two children of uh, the Red Ape family, is kidnapped by this like new arc villain called Dr. Jeeves who, um, you know, wants to get the uh, golden NFT, which is a memory stick, which doesn't really make sense, given what NFTs are, from the first episode. 
And this is also tied into the fact that Hunky feels like his parents don't love him as much as his more competent brother, Caesar. Meanwhile, Dr. Nwatiti is uh, struggling with his, like, desire to become uh, vegan and, like, cut back on eating people. And we've got these other smaller groups of uh, villains that are, like, the fat fucking ape who works with Laurel and Hardy and these two, like, white chimps who are also out for the money. Like, there's a lot going on, but, like, what's baffling is it doesn't even feel chaotic in a bad way. It feels like they spin these narrative plates pretty well, which I can't believe I'm saying. Yeah, that's the thing. This actually felt like it had a uh, proper structure to it. And, like, a lot of these arcs got completed. Like, those, uh, that gaggle of villains got phased out for the more powerful villain, and it was clear, like, where the hierarchy was, kind of setting up him as a reasonably, like, positioned antagonist. Whereas the stuff with Hunky, it's, it's clear that, like, you know, he kind of earns a little bit of respect from the family by the end of the episode by, um, actually saving the day. Yeah, genuinely. It, there's structure here that is executed like okay for what this is yeah that's the thing like again it's not good by any external metric but this does not feel like a first draft script they spent time on this there was a i imagine a degree of planning and a degree of editing afterwards yeah i i Here's the thing. The the cynic in me believes that, like, the first episode was intentionally, like, really shitty on purpose just to see if they could get away with it. And then, like, they were planning to make this one the first serious one. I mean, that's possible, but at the same time, I could also believe that they felt genuinely burned enough by the criticism that they thought, well, we'll show them. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, they had enough money to, like, you know, improve in the interim and maybe whatever compelled them to to make it better was a thing that was decided after the fact. I don't know. I can't say. This whole thing boggles my mind and injures me psychically more every time I think about it. Yeah, because what I hate is if you told me, Henry, you, you either have to watch the Red Ape Family episode two or I can pluck a random episode of, like, I don't know, Family Guy from the latest season. I'd pick Red Ape Family Season 2. Uh, episode 2. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's it's awful. It's the, But here's the thing. This feels like the, like, economic, like, artistic equivalent of, like, eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Like, at the end of the day, whatever enjoyment we can get out of it, it's unethical. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, it feels <laughs> gross. Like, I watched it with ad block on, so they're not getting ad revenue from me. <laughs> But, um, yeah, no, same, dude. But, but like, <laughs> seriously, it, it, it is bizarre. It does create this odd cognitive dissonance. Because, again, um, Gus and I, we're honest people. We have been from the start. Like, you know, our first video on Hell of a Boss was I was wrong about Hell of a Boss. Because we're, we're not the kind of people who, for the sake of our own egos, will lie about this shit. We earnestly have to tell you, yes, it's better than episode one. Genuinely, and by some metrics... Um, it isn't badly written. And it brings us no joy to do that, but we have an allegiance to give our honest appraisals of writing at the same time as we have an allegiance to say that NFTs are terrible for the planet and for people Yeah, in it, general. It puts us in an odd position. So, like, I want to talk about some of the granular details in this. Um, first, I, I want to talk about Dr. Nwatiti, who they actually try to give some character to, which is fucking bizarre to me. Oh, and by the way... Something that, um, we made a community post for this deserves to be in the video. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 you know what I'm going to say. After we joked, uh, last time about how Dr. Nwatiti was muscling, uh, in on the turf of our channel character, Direwolf, who is, like, a vaude, goth, furry wolf lady voiced by, uh, our pal Nicole Goodnight. Um, our good pal Rocket Shark, who goes by, um, at vorjokes.jpg on Twitter, I'm sure I'll put the at on the screen, made this incredible piece of fan art of, uh, Dire Wolf, uh, eating Dr. Nwatiti in the style of the old Goya painting, sat and devouring his son. And it's just too oh. good to not have on screen right now. And it's clear it, that it works. It is because incredible. They, they literally remove that aspect of his character in this episode. 
<laughs> so so what we've retroactively done, because the Red Ape family is apparently competent now, is that we've created a piece of alternate universe fan art starring one of our OCs for the Red Ape family. What have we done? Yeah, and, and the crazy thing is, technically we can say that's canon, because... In this episode, they introduce the plot point that the multiverse exists, and that every piece of criticism given of the show is canon to the show. Thereby, in our universe, thanks to Rocket Shark, um, our gal Direwolf did canonically eat a version of Dr. Nortiti. <laughs> I love that. Can we be canon yet? <laughs> yeah! No, genuinely. Initially, I was thinking that they should work us two into it, but you know what? I'm not going to be vain. They should work Direwolf into the show at some point, and if you want that to happen, please comment on this video, hashtag include Direwolf, because our gal yeah. deserves the recognition. She's a she's a more marketable canine than anyone from Super Doge. Exactly. Hashtag include Dial. Put it down there and include your reasons why uh, the, the fucking Queen of War on YouTube deserves to be in there. Because do you know what? It can't get any more cursed, can it? But yeah, so no. Dr. Nortiti in this episode hypnotizes himself to be vegan. Like, it gets to have some genuinely kind of funny moments in it. Uh, Chucky gets to kind of have a bit of a character as as this kind of, like... I hate to fucking say this, but I genuinely like, conceptually, what they've done here with Chucky more than what the later seasons of Rick and Morty have done with Rick Sanchez, because it genuinely feels like they've done a character who, like, arrogantly believes he's the shit, but in reality is a dysfunctional loser a lot better than that show does because, frankly, Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland aren't that great at making a dysfunctional character that they're not also glorifying. You know, <laughs> like, w the the people who are going to be mad at you about that are Rick and Morty fans. Fuck them. Yeah, wh whose opinions I don't respect anyway, <laughs> so fuck you. <laughs> Come at me. I mean, I, I I thought the the line he had when he was talking to his two sons, it's like, you guys are each half of me. I'm the brains and brawn of the family, is actually a pretty well-executed character beat. Yeah, and then Winky is like, but who comes up with the plans here? Yeah, yeah, Can we exactly. talk about what they did with Winky, by the way? Do you, do you want to go into that a little bit? Right, yeah, because in the, in the first episode, Winky had a very obvious British accent, but they kind of took that away from her in this. They not only took that away, they made a joke. In universe, everyone hated that. That's one of the things that uh, the, all those people from the different universe, including the parody Saber Spark. Yeah, Saber Fart, which mm, Saber not, fart. not their finest. In terms of, no. Like, is that, is that really the best they came up with? Saber Fart? Yeah, a few more drafts on that one, like, you guys. There are better jokes than that <laughs> in the episode. Yeah, no, legitimately. Also... Can we talk about the fact that the main villain's special weapon is a thing that he basically took from Super Doge conceptually? It's a it's a beam that turns people into NFTs. Yeah, which is directly the the weapon the um the was it Fat Cat used in Super Doge? I'm sorry, every character in Super Doge was utterly unmemorable. <laughs> It was the Mad Catter who was one of the Fat Cats who believe in fiat currency, which is why they're also the Fiat Cats. And yet they make NFTs. <laughs> For some reason. It's... Because they want to sell it back into fiat. Also, can we just talk about how in all of these shows, getting turned into an NFT is a horrible existential nightmare that no one wants to suffer from? Yeah, it, it's like a... It's, it's so funny that even this far in... Even these people who are, like, comical, like, NFT true believers don't seem to know what the fuck an NFT is. Because there is a horrendously uncomfortable NFT in this that is Baby Elon, which skeeves the fuck out of me. That is, like, a physical being, but the other NFT is, like, on a memory stick. But all of the characters in it are also characters from NFTs, like... 
what layer of reality are we operating on here? Yeah, so, like, are NFTs these things that you trade, or are they, like, the manifestations of those pictures? Like, is this operating on food fight rules? And if so, then it doesn't have any rules at all! <laughs> no, genuinely, like, if, if there was any other piece of, like, media made by the real world that could be compared to this, it is Food Fight, because it has that same just vibe of, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, yeah, like all of the, like, there was even a, a minor character villain in Food Fight called Fat Cat Burglar, who was a rat who steals cats. <laughs> like, it, it has that same level of, what the fuck? fuck were you guys thinking like i know charlie sheen was involved but did you like get into his stash while you were making this <laughs> speaking of um th the episode has baby elon give chucky a weird diaper mushroom that makes him have a trip uh, revealing that he might in fact be the physical manifestation of the golden nft which is like what a shockingly well animated trip by the way, I <laughs> and mm -hmm. infuriatingly well, like Meg is in the room uh, over there, and hi. I, I Meg says hi. Meg, who as as far as the channel know, masters in animation. I turned that like the computer around to Meg while that was playing, but and Meg. It's not. Here's the thing. It's not like great, but it definitely looks like they didn't half-ass it. It looks like something that somebody on my course would have made and gotten a really good grade for it. Yeah, like, it has, like, it, it's obviously not studio quality, but it has a shocking level of, like, fluidity. Uh, compared to the, the quality you see on some, like, mid to high tier, like, Undertale fan animations. Mm, yeah, and that's the thing. It also made those dogs and, like, the weird visor people from, like, the first episode look like an actual credible threat, which is so fucking funny compared to, like, the way that they were in that first episode. Yeah, genuinely, when, when they were, like, clipping through the walls and shit like that, like, it, it it's odd because they're kind of, like, cribbing notes from, uh, like, plot beats in, like, Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, I I guess. I mean, like, you know, why not why not steal from everyone else? We can right click your shit. <laughs> yeah, like I, <laughs> I, I I am so baffled by this whole thing. Like it's just I it's weird. <laughs> here like yeah, so so I guess I guess like in conclusion like the Red Ape family is apparently actually a real show now, and yeah. we should all be afraid for what that means. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. Like, because the thing is, it's genuinely looking like if, if even one more episode comes out, this is going to be the NFT show that outlived NFTs. Which is going to be shockingly bizarre. That that will be a really interesting cultural artifact. And hey, if NFTs aren't around and this gets unironically good, then like we, we wouldn't have to feel bad about enjoying it. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't have to feel bad about enjoying it. It'll it'll oh my god. Yeah, yeah, I gotta say, when this episode <laughs> came out, this was not the video I expected to record, but hey. Color me morbidly curious. Exactly. All right. <laughs> I guess I'd like to say in closing, don't support NFTs. Um, hashtag include Direwolf. And, um, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> tiny personal thing. But this is just, just a fun something that I'm excited about and want to plug. Um, I know I'm not on social media, but uh, I made a website, henrygalley.com, if you want to get in contact with me about, like, work and stuff. Gus will, Gus will stick that in the description. But yeah, I, I'm finally just a slight bit less mysterious if you want to email me for whatever reason. And uh, thanks for anyone who's shown interest on that. But yeah, <sighs> what an experience, Gus. <laughs> Uh, 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 I, it's, it's, it's hell. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know what the future holds, but, uh, we'll be seeing you. In the near future. That one. You said it. You said the thing I usually say. You, you did it. You did it good. <laughs>